All right, Dr. Mike, it's uh, good morning from Sydney. Good afternoon in New York. It's, uh, it's really cold here this morning, but looking at you, things are heating up in New York. So what's going it on? Is, it is sweltering. It is 86. It is 30 degrees Celsius for those non-Americans out there. And the big tropical storm went through New York City last night, knocked down a bunch, a bunch of trees. Our power is out. And uh, well, our power is kind of browned out which is why I'm able to do this podcast, but there is no air conditioning right now. So if you start seeing me fucking sweating through this, uh, this sultry, sultry tank top, you know why. It's not because Chris is beautiful, but it is because Chris is beautiful. Well, you're only human. But, uh, hey, man, <laughs> sun's out, guns out. Let's do this. Sun's out, guns out. I wish I had some bigger guns, but hey, it's a different <laughs> point in my life. Well, we could probably change that. You know, it is a, this is going to be on the, sitting on the computer, so we can, uh, we can do whatever we want with it. We can. Give me, some, give me some, some bigger pipes. So we're episode 14. We're one week closer to being pain-free at 100. Uh, we've, got, we've got a good topic to cover off on today because I think, uh, I think this is one of the more important topics that we're going to cover off on. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a big problem and it's... It's underappreciated, under managed, and undertreated, um, and that's a that's a big problem for everyone because we've all got the potential to to experience this issue, and a lot of people will be walking around with this problem, knowing that they've got a problem, but not knowing what's causing it um, and not having it treated because there's not enough people that are treating it well. Um, so we're talking about entrapment of nerves, nerve entrapment. Um, so we need to break that down and explain what that is before we do that though. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday because, it, you know, we sort of discussed that we were going to talk about this. Um, and so I was thinking about back through, you know, the education, my tertiary education that I've had over the last several years, and you've been down through that process as well. Um, and so I'm thinking about, you know, why is this subject something that's not really, broadly um i guess it's recognized but it's just not at the forefront of people's minds it seems in musculoskeletal care generally speaking how much of your education when you went through that process so you had several years of of university level education how much of that time was nerve entrapment or treatment of nerve entrapment um dedicated to to teaching you about that Zero minutes, zero seconds. I didn't learn a single thing about nerve entrapment. I mean, you generally understand um, very basic things like carpal tunnel syndrome. You understand the symptomatology of it. But it's not like they gave us a, a, a mechanism for treating that or even gave us the belief that we could treat that and, and effectively change something. You know, you had a little bit of talk about like a double crush injury where you're getting a kind of peripheral nerve entrapment in the upper extremity in multiple spots and how it'll kind of just perpetuate each other. You know, for instance, you, you, you get an entrapment in, you know, say the, the pronator teres muscle, and then you're also getting an entrapment, say, in the carpal tunnel. And if you don't treat both of those locations, that you won't get any um, alleviation of symptoms. But outside of that, even that was post-grad more than anything, but yeah, none, none whatsoever. It wasn't even any any type of nerve entrapment. Would always was always talked about in the context of a space occupying disc lesion, um, kind of impinging on the nerve at the nerve root. But there wasn't any specific. Um, hey, this gets stuck here, and this is how you treat it, and you know this is how prevalent it is, and you know they definitely didn't tell us that you could make a healthy living if you wanted to just treating nerve entrapments. Uh, yeah, a bit disappointing, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been my experience as well. We have had it. It's something that's been mentioned. It's, um, you know, I can recall having some slide decks where it sort of shows some, the, the idea and some common sites um, where these things happen. But, you know, there's no real guidance on, on how you deal with it. So if you do, if you're able to recognize that this is happening and you want to treat it, then... What do you do with, you know, as it stands, you don't get the tool set for it. So it's, you have to go and find that. Um, so we've been lucky enough to, to understand that, to find that, to pursue that. It's a skill that we, we practice and, um, 
we're always always trying to improve and get better at that. Um, but let's let's break down what a nerve entrapment is because you know it it's something that we understand and uh, it's something that everyone needs to understand. I think because it's a big problem. So we're talking about um, peripheral nerves of the body generally, um, and that these things become stuck. Um, so what is it? What happens? Um, what is a what does a nerve entrapment mean to you? Nerve entrapment means that, again, there's a peripheral nerve that is stuck to some other surface in the body. It's not sliding and gliding. Your peripheral nerve should should slide and glide like dental floss. So right between your teeth, bam, bam, bam. You know, e on e on e on boom, slide really, really nicely. And when they don't slide nicely, you get a myriad of symptoms. You get kind of the classic nerve esque symptoms of numbness, tingling, burning. Uh, you get uh, protective tension around that nerve. You know, your body understands that if that nerve is not sliding, it's a bad strategy to put a ton of tension on it because if that nerve breaks, then you're pretty screwed, right? It's, it's not easy to regenerate your sciatic nerve <laughs> from your hip down. So yeah, you'll get a lot of tightness, a lot of burning, a lot of tingling, a lot of numbing sensations. Uh, and the, the primary mechanism in which that nerve gets stuck down to an adjacent tissue is, you know, adhesion will actually cross bridge from that tissue, that muscle ligament or tendon onto the nerve. And it's like your nerve has been super glued down to, you know, a particular structure. So there's a certain symptom set that comes along with that. There's a certain kind of palpatory thing that we look for. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, once you know it and understand that it, it's a cinch to fix and it's, it's a beautiful damn thing. Yeah. It's, if you remember back to anatomy lab, you would have seen what these things look like. It's kind of like a, you know, there's varying sizes of nerves in the diameters and that, but it kind of looks like a piece of spaghetti, I guess. Right. Like it's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's running through. And so these things like to move when, when a joint moves, it needs to go with it. Um, and so if it can't, then it's only going to let you go so far because it doesn't want to, become stretched it doesn't want to become damaged um and these things are very sensitive too it doesn't take much to make a nerve unhappy so if you think about um the funny bone for instance the, the funny bone that's not so funny um you've got the ulnar nerve that passes through that part of your elbow and it's actually quite superficial in a certain place where it is you've got some some skin over the top so you don't need to put a lot of pressure on that when you bump it and uh and you get that sort of like bang that zing kind of thing um so these things are you know generally speaking the nerves are, are held within bundles of tissue within muscles and within compartments and they're moving through there and they want to be able to move they want to be able to slide they want to be able to glide uh, and so like when Mike says they get tethered down and they can't do that, um, that's when we start getting those symptoms. So when you have a, a patient come in and you're taking a history, um, what are the things that sort of jump out at you that are making you think already that there might be some nerve entrapment that you're going to find in the exam? Yeah, symptom set and symptom location. So again, as I discussed earlier you're looking at numbness tingling burning sensation those are those are slam dunk symptom presentations and it's not always as black as and white as that but when it does it's like you know you get a little excited because you know you're going to be able to fix somebody or you know you're perceivably going to be able to fix somebody uh the actual nerves in the periphery some of them will innervate a, a certain i guess volume and location of skin tissue so if you have somebody say, hey, I've got numbness, and I say, you know, with a paintbrush, paint on the areas of your skin that you're experiencing that numbness, and they go in through here and they start painting their pinky finger, their ring finger, and, and half of their middle finger, or whatever it may be, then you've got a really good understanding of, okay, what nerve is being affected, um, and, and where am I going to focus my exam in order to just confirm or deny that. So it's very specifically in the location, very specifically in, in the quantity or the, excuse me, the quality of, of that symptom set. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they absolutely, these things all have, uh, have maps, you know, it's defined anatomy. So if you have that, um, if you have that picture, you can generally trace it back where it starts to get a little bit squirrely is 
when you've got something that's a little bit more central, I suppose, and then you start getting some overlaying, some overlaying areas. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess to split this out a little bit, we're not talking about that big sort of disc herniation or something where we're compressing a nerve root. We're really talking about uh, stuff that's happening a little bit further out. So um, that's why it's peripheral nerve. So we're moving out from the spinal cord um, and we're sort of looking at these are, you know, more commonly going to happen around the extremities, right? Um, or even sort of from the neck. Yeah. Down. I was going to say that's, that's the only one that you'll get an actual nerve root right. uh, dermatologic presentation. So there's some really common ones that we would see more often than others. Um, what are the common ones that you, that you generally treat? The most common one, and this is by far head and shoulders, the most common. And it's, it's one of those situations where if you're a listener and, and you're an individual that's had tight hamstrings your whole life, pay attention to what we're about to talk to talk about because we can change your life. But the most common nerve entrapment in the human body is the sciatic nerve at the external rotators of the hip, more specifically, right, where that nerve kind of peaks out of the piriformis muscle and travels over the gemellus superior. So long story short, the biggest nerve in your body gets tacked down right underneath your piriformis. So a lot of people will classify that as quote unquote a piriformis syndrome, and right? We've gone over the nature of syndromes on this podcast. A syndrome is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom set that is caused by a sciatic nerve entrapment. So that, that is easily the most common one that I find. If you can't get your you know, legs to 90 degrees in a straight leg raise, chances are that's where the area is. And um, I, I don't know what it is about human biomechanics and, and what we're doing wrong. I'm sure it's got a lot to do with the volume of sitting that we do, or you know, some people are more anatomically and genetically at risk for it, in my opinion easily hands down the most single, I guess the single greatest and, and most common sciatic or excuse me, peripheral nerve entrapment. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and I think, like you said, it could be a kind of a life changing thing to fix for someone. And, you know, for us, that's not a, that's not a huge deal because that's, you know, that's bread and butter, right? That's really what we, what we work for and what we practice. Um, but for someone to go from maybe trying to touch their toes and being able to go as far as their knees for most of their life to then within, you know, not a, the space of a lot of time, then being able to go and, and touch their toes or touch the ground from a standing position. That's a big deal. You know, that changes a lot. It's incredible. I mean, just today I had somebody who I think it was yesterday, actually, is a police officer. Uh, Tony, if you're listening, huge shout out. Doubt you're listening. You're probably playing with your Hawk Khaleesi right now. Um, but yeah, he was 58 degrees of straight leg raise when he walked in. And he's like, I've just got this generalized weakness, numbness, tingly sensation happening around my butt. Tested it, 58 degrees. I think he left yesterday after visit number three, and he was 78 to 82 degrees so it's like a life-changing had never i don't think he's ever touched his toes in his entire life and he's like an inch and a half from, from touching his toes he's actually like oh my left leg needs to be worked on right now because i'm i think my left leg is the biggest limiting factor in in my straight or my standing on pelvic flexion right now so it's it's a really it's a yeah it's a life-changing fix it is and the other aspect of that is that it when it's not moving well so the sciatic nerve gets adhered to those little glute muscles and so when you bend it can't go with you and it's going to stop you but that's also feeding into you know what we typically see as low back pain cases um, do you see a lot of low back chronic low back cases that do not have sciatic nerve entrapment involvement um it depends. It depends on the, the patient base that I have. Uh, you know, at any given time, I, I actually find it more aligns with like gender lines or, or sex lines or whatever you want to call it, chromosomal lines. I don't want to get into any freaking weird shit here. Um, but typically females don't have the volume of sciatic nerve entrapment as men do. I don't know if it's, it's just like, Hey, they're, they're conditioned to be more flexible. They're conditioned to arch their back a little bit more. 
but most men that I have, and I'll say about 20% of women that I have with low back pain have some sort of involvement of the sciatic nerve. Yeah, look, I've found it to be pretty pretty common as well, probably more, as you say, in men, for whatever reason that is. Um, but yeah, it does definitely tend to feed into it, for sure. What would be the next one that you see typically? Um, for me, I'm probably going up towards the upper extremity more um, around subscat. Yeah, I probably see, I see scaling a little bit more than, than subscap. Um, it's really hard to differentiate the two. So it, it's kind of a moot point anyways, because you're going to get a lot of the same symptom presentation with scaling as you would with a subscap, it's really hard to differentiate between nerve root and brachial cord, at least in my opinion. Um, maybe I just lack the, the anatomical knowledge to, to dive through that. But yeah, I get that a lot. I get scaling a lot. And then you start getting into you know, very, very simple things like, you know, carpal tunnel, um, hypothenar tunnel, you know, things like flexor carpial narus, all those things. They're kind of tied, I would say. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's hard to differentiate between here and here um, mm -hmm. in, in figuring that out. But um, yeah, I guess like to give an example of of how that sort of presents, my um, my girlfriend's a rock climber, so um, that's that's sort of her thing. That's what she loves to do. Uh, so very heavy on the on the extremities. You're doing a lot of lot of work with your arms, um, and it's happened twice now. The probably not for about a year. So we, we got on top of it, but she was starting to get some symptoms through one arm and, and it wasn't really following a pattern that they were nerve like symptoms. So there was some sort of numbness and some tingling going on, but it wasn't, you know, when we look at where is that coming from? What does it map back to? It wasn't really following a, a defined pattern. So we kind of had to go up higher to think, all right, well, if it's not a, a lower down peripheral nerve that we can map through, then perhaps it's coming from, you know, more up in that sort of higher up in the cords in the trunk kind of thing. Um, so we ended up clearing out the, the subscap up, up there um, and it's sort of up around that pectoral tunnel. That's, that's where it was. So because, you know, we've got the three nerves coming through there. So that sort of explained it. Um, but, you know, she talked to other rock climbers about that and a lot of other people had experienced it as well um, or something similar. And the advice that they'd had in trying to get on top of that was just you need to stretch more. Um, and I think that's pretty common, right? Because if we even use the example of the hamstrings with the sciatic nerve, um, how many people have you heard that are just go, man, I stretch and I stretch and I stretch and this never changes? Yeah, you're never going to stretch and, and remove adhesion, especially when your brain is preventing you from accessing the range of motions that are actually going to, to tension those tissues, right? I mean, you, you might be able to get some kind of change with like a nerve floss drill, uh, albeit it's going to be more temporary than it is going to be permanent. But yeah, you can't, you can't stretch because as you go to stretch that muscle, you're actually putting that nerve under a tremendous amount of load. And in doing that, you're going to get that muscle to consequently tighten up even more. So it's one of those things where it hurts a lot. It feels like you're doing something. You get this warm, fuzzy feeling afterwards because you, you know, you downregulate your nervous system. But at the end of the day, if you don't stretch on one day, so if you, if you, if you go and you test your straight leg raise on a Monday and it's 60 degrees, and you go and you do even, let's be really, really generous and say you go and do a 30 minute focused hamstring stretching session. And you do that, you use eccentrics, you use, you know, yin yoga, you use PIR, you use whatever sort of technique that you have. And if you come back on a Wednesday and your hamstrings are still 60 degrees, you've just wasted 30 minutes of your time. Right. And you're going to look online and see a YouTube video that says, oh, you got to stretch your hamstrings for two months before you start to get any sort of things or two weeks before you start to get any sort of, of change. And it's like you're going to waste two months of your time throwing a, 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 an intervention at a problem and not getting any results. And then you're going to say to me, but going to see a doctor is expensive. Well, 
you know, time is money and it, it, it pays to get something fixed in, you know, what would take years of stretching and, and not even get the same results to be able to expedite that process to three weeks. It's a big deal, right? It's going to cost something. You don't, you don't get any, there's no, there's no free rides in this world. So yeah. So yeah. What is it about the treatment that, I mean, what is it about we do what we do that, that people need? I mean, this is, this needs a hands-on treatment. This needs a very, um, this needs a very specific content. You, you know, it's not good enough just to be in the general area and, and maybe get a slam dunk. It's just not going to work. So, you know, what is, how do we treat these things and why is that important? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it comes with a, a, a great palpatory skill. So, you know, Chris and I, we can go in there and we can actually feel the spot and or spots that that nerve is stuck down. You know, if, you're, if your sciatic nerve is the width of, we'll say my pinky finger, I can actually get my hand in there, palpate that nerve, see how much it's moving, see if it's moving. I can feel the junction between the nerve and the muscle and I can say, that spot's adhered. And then what, what you really want to do is, is you want to pin basically your thumb up into that adhesion and then stretch the nerve through it and physically break that nerve off the adjacent tissue. And if you're a patient that's listening and you've had me do this, especially to your sciatic nerve, it's not a very comfortable thing, right? It's like, you don't know if you want to puke, cry or laugh, but at the end of the day, it, it, it works so well. Cause then I can go back in and palpate that nerve and say, Oh shoot, it moves better. Or, oh shoot. I can feel that junction between the nerve and the tissue a little bit better. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, you can break it off. And if you think you can break it off with a lacrosse ball, then please, please fly to New York, come and see me. I'll take you to a nice dinner, show me how, and let's get after it. Believe me, I have tried to do this on my own. I've tried everything. And, you know, I have, I guess I have the knowledge, I have the understanding of, of what is going on there and what I'm feeling. And dude, I've tried to like replicate someone else having that contact on there with, you know, I've tried, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you might be able to go to like a sex toy shop and get like a single thumb and like suction cup it onto the wall. Now we're talking. Hey. You know Maybe what that's... I did, right? I actually have, uh, it's sort of like a, a cane, like a knobbly cane. That you <laughs> Fair cane, to, right? Yeah. right? That kind of thing. Um, so I put myself in a side posture and try to sort of hook it in there and hold it, hold some tension on and bring some, yeah, anyway, yeah, it doesn't work. Can't do I'm it. I'm telling you, sex toy shop. Go to sex toy shop. That's your best bet. Just get like a one single finger, find a way to attach it to a suction cup and just make sure you're, nobody's home. Make sure your wife, make sure your girlfriend's not home. Because if she comes in and you're lying on your side yeah, <laughs> up think, against yeah. the wall with a finger suction cup there, you're not going to be married uh, too much longer. Or maybe you will. Maybe it's going to spark your marriage. But, hey, that's your best bet. If you want to go for it, go for it. I think I'll pass. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the crux of it, isn't it? If um, – if you have these symptoms, if you're having, you know, if there is the tingling, if there is the numbness, if there is the burning, um, if there is that chronic, chronic tightness and even like muscle knots that you just don't go away. Um, it, it needs an expert. It needs someone that is, that is trained in actually identifying this and actually treating this and doing it very specifically. What's the statistic? of unresolved muscle pain that is due to nerve entrapments. Do you have that number like off the top of your head? No. It's, I, it's something astounding. I think it's somewhere between, you know, what Dr. Brady has sorted out, somewhere between 30 and 60% of, of unresolved pain cases are actually due to peripheral nerve entrapments that have just never even been considered before. That's you know just too I mean? high. Like, it's too high. Like your, your accessory nerve, right? Ooh, I've got tight traps. Well, your accessory nerve is tacked down to your trapezius, rhomboid, and levator muscle, and there's protective tension around it. Like who would who would think? You would have never fathomed in a million years. Once you got through those cranial nerves in the head and neck anatomy, you put that sucker away and you never thought about it again. But when he's like, Yeah, accessory nerve comes up skull down into it innervates your trapezius muscle, you're like, holy shit, that makes a lot of sense because how many people have tight traps? And how many people just have never gotten that 
even considered. And how many times have you gone in there and you go and you break that nerve off the trapezius muscle and you simultaneously want to throw up and throw a party at the same time? Because it's so gross when you feel that thing ripping off, but you're like, I did it. Yay. Like I just eliminated your trap pain, Miss my, my, my what's a fibromyalgia, <laughs> right? <laughs> like your trap pain's gone cuz you're just sticky as shit. Yeah, it's a bit like last week when we talked about the hip capsule and a Dr. Magnus and when, and you know, I said who would think to go and treat these things to get the front of the hip and it's a little bit a little bit like this, right? You, you kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, accessory nerve, what? But when you think about anatomy, it's just, we're all walking around with this. It makes sense. Right. It's just unfortunately not at the forefront of, uh, of everyone's mind when someone's coming in with this problem. Yeah, and if you, it, it, it's crazy. And I guess even on the fibromyalgia topic, if you look at a fibromyalgia pain chart, I don't know if you can pull one out really quickly, but fibromyalgic pain chart, and you're like, all of those spots, hmm. It looks like they're in spots of common nerve entrapments that you and I see, right? It's like, oh gosh, both traps, both elbows, both hips, both scalenes. You're like, oh, hmm, maybe this fibromyalgia thing isn't as simple or isn't as clear cut as people are saying. Maybe fibromyalgia is a diagnosis for individuals that have gone to multiple doctors and, and haven't gotten an accurate nerve entrapment diagnosis. So it, it, it gets to be interesting when you think of that, how many people have this that don't even know about it. You've gone to a chiropractor, you've gone to a PT, you've, you've gone to everything and you're still not pain. There's, there's a decent chance. There's a statistically relevant chance that you have a nerve entrapment somewhere. Yeah. And unfortunately you have to go and, you know, as a provider, you have to go and take specialty training to almost even have it on your radar as something that you're thinking about and then right. to actually be competent at, at treating it. You know, I, I sort of first heard about this, um, through active release techniques. Um, right. Don't they have like a nerve glide thing for the piriformis muscle? Yeah, they used to have, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have a whole course for nerve entrapment. Um, it's actually, yeah, they've got a lot of protocols. Um, almost, I think sometimes a little bit too many. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think, you know, integrative diagnosis kind of simplified uh, a lot of that and, and really dialed it in um, and made it a lot more effective. Um but yeah, it's, you know, it's a shame that you have to go through to that level and really go looking for it to actually find it. It should just be uh, a lot more, a lot more prevalent. Yeah. Your, your soft tissue class in chiropractic college should, you, you should have like three or four trimesters of soft tissue work and it, it should be an entire trimester's worth of, of hands-on um, manual laboratory instruction without a doubt. I mean, that's how, that's how you really change the face of, of musculoskeletal health. And we haven't really talked about this, but we have a little bit how, how chiropractic college is shit. And it's like what, what, what people don't understand is it, it, it just kind of perpetuates itself and shit. It, it, it's so, it's so infuriating where, you know, if you went into a chiropractic college and I'm, I'm not even saying eliminate all the adjustment courses because I'm not even being that greedy, but your soft tissue courses need to be so much better you need to not have like three trimesters of rehab you should you should almost have a year and a half straight just soft tissue work one rehab course super easy diagnosis course like how do you bridge the gap between that physical exam and actually formulating a diagnosis and 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 that's it it's 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 really a shame it, and it's sad because you see people going and, and i have friends that are just graduating right now and it's like I just want to show you the light, but you can't, you can't until you're ready. And unfortunately, if you're ready, you might, you might be ready to quit too. You know what I mean? So, you know, when I get you in three years or, or when you're finally ready to talk in three years or whatever it is, it's over, man. It's over for some people. You're selling medical equipment or teaching anatomy at a junior college. 
Yeah, it's frustrating. It's a. Uh, I mean, you and I could we could talk about this for a long time. I think because it's you know, it, it's been a big part of of our lives for a while, and um, you know, you put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of a lot of other people's time um, to do that. And yeah, you know, we had I think one one class on soft tissue soft tissue work, soft tissue manipulation, whatever you want to call it, um, in first year. And, you know, I remember that the teachers actually said, listen, guys, this is, this is it. This is what you're going to get. Um, that's it. Uh, and, you know, I just remember thinking that that was disappointing. Um, and it, it, disappointing for us in terms of what we wanted to learn. But I think it's just disappointing for the patients, you know, the, I guess on the theme of what we're talking about today, just being able to have more time learning to palpate these problems. And even if you, even if you don't have the expert skills yet to treat it very effectively, you're going to have a better shot at finding it, at finding the problem and recognizing it because you can palpate more and you know what you're looking for. And uh, yeah, so no, I completely agree. I, I hope that, uh, you know, in the future, it becomes a, a bigger part of, of that education, but um, who knows? So yeah, we've gotten a little bit sidetracked today, but uh, yeah, man, I think, you know, for me, this is a super important topic and it, we might even be able to follow it up with a bit more detail on some of these um, common nerve entrapments that we have. And that might, you know, that might sort of resonate with some people that are, that are walking around experiencing this problem and looking for some answers. And, you know, hopefully that, that helps them um, head in a direction that they need to to get some uh, get some proper investigation and treatment. Um, but yeah, look, I think this is a major problem. Um, it's good for us. Like we talked about this last week. Obviously, it's you know there's there's less people out there doing it. It's it's good for us as providers if we're the ones that are doing it. But it sucks for that high percentage of people that are walking around and, and needing the help. Yeah. And moral of the story is, is if you have an issue that's been plaguing you for a long time, it's in your best interest from a statistical point of view to try and at least ask your doctor, Hey, could this be a peripheral nerve entrapment? And just get in it. Just, just ask him or her or yeah. And <laughs> just see what they say. If they're like, Oh, I don't you know. It doesn't even make sense. Why would it be a peripheral nerve entrapment? Then it, it's a good indication that you might want to look for somebody else. If they're like, hmm, let me think. Let me get back to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some research on that. And then at least you got their heads moving uh, and their brain works burning, you know, at, at a rate that will hopefully get you some answers. All right, folks. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap it up there today. We've got to get Dr. Mike out of here before he starts sweating all over his bald head. And, oh, no. Uh, yeah. I need, I'm going to need a sweatband if we can't get this fixed soon. You're going to see me in like uh, – What's the Will Ferrell movie where he's the basketball player? Oh, semi-pro. Semi-pro. I want to be looking like semi-pro in, uh, in a couple minutes here. Well, we better get you out of here before the, the shirt comes off. Some people want to see that, but not most people. All right, man. Well, you have a good week. I hope the, uh, hope the, the air conditioner kicks in soon, and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. See you, Chris.